just before I get into my homily, I want to uh, catch your attention and, and focus you. Uh, these little munchkins, kinder, uh, pre-K, kinder, and first grade, already learning Spanish. Can you imagine? Uh, and let me say you're a Filipino child who's never spoken a word of Spanish in your house, okay? You don't know any Spanish. And you come pre-K or K, and they start half the day in English, half the day in Spanish. And that's the first time you hear Spanish. OMG. By eighth grade, got to come out like this little one here reading Spanish at that age. Now, most Latinos, I think, they may speak Spanish at home, the little ones, but read it? I don't think so. And read like a letter of Paul? I don't think so. So, bravissimo. <laughs> what a gift we have here. What an opportunity. You know, I want to try to demystify a little bit the idea of a call from God. Because sometimes we, I think, romanticize it like a person, like Father Perry was called to be a priest, called by God. I believe that. But it's not some mystical, incredible thing. And it doesn't just happen once. The first time I thought about being a priest, I was in fourth grade for about a week, and then it was gone. I thought about it in seventh grade again, only for this reason, because my parents stopped by to visit the grave of a friend that had died at San Fernando uh, Mission uh, Cemetery, and I went with them and got out of the car. I'm standing there at the grave. I was just little, fourth grade, uh, seventh grade, I'm sorry. And I looked over at the mission, and then I saw what was the seminary in those days, but I didn't know what it was. And I said to my dad, what's that building over there? He said, that's a seminary. That's where a boy goes to study to be a priest. And something in my head said, I'm going to go there. I didn't say it out loud, but I just remember I, I said, I'm going to go there. It was the weirdest thing. And then I dropped out. I didn't say, think about it or say it to anybody. But in eighth grade, there was a group of men. They uh, used to be called the Sarah Club. I don't know if they're still around. And they transported eighth graders out to the seminary to visit it uh, on a weekend and you introduce you to the possibility of being called to be a priest. Five in my class went. So that's how I entered. I got the call somehow, and I'll say from God, but it, it was just weird, actually. But what was really interesting was how it stuck with me. Because I started in a class of 170 students in my own class, and four others from my class from grammar school. And I'm the only one from my class the, of the five of us that went who was ordained a priest 12 years later. And out of the 170, the biggest class that ever went through the, the first year of, of high school seminary, out of 170, 12 years later, only eight of that original 170 were ordained. So I'll tell you what happened to me over the years. Where I kept getting the call wasn't really because of me. It was because people were leaving. I'd have a best friend that I said, he's going to be a fantastic priest. We're going to be priests together. And he'd say, I'm leaving at the end of the year. What? And they, they just dropped off. And every time it happened, I'd say, why am I staying? Why am I staying? The call is something that I think bubbles up from deep down inside, and it keeps coming up. And you know it's authentic when it keeps coming up, when it keeps speaking to you. You know, I prepare people for marriage. They come to my office the first time, and I say, I'm not preparing you for your wedding, for your wedding day. I said, I could do that blindfolded. I've done it so many times. And, and it's not about your wedding day. It is, but it's so much more. It's about your life together as a married person. You're making a lifelong commitment to be with this person until one of you or both of you die. That's a big thing to do. And I have to say, in all my years as a priest, it's kind of rare when I feel, when I feel preparing them and listening to them and looking at them, that they're the perfect fit. And, and it happens, I, I, it's hard to describe, but it's, it's just the way they talk to each other, about each other, the way they listen to each other. And when you marry a person that you know this is the one, I, I often will say when I feel that with a couple, I often will say it the way, you know, this isn't the first person they ever dated. They dated several people. Why did they leave those other people? And how did it happen that these two finally said, this is the one, that's the one? 
That's how I think the call works. Something bubbles up from inside and you just know. And it's like a, a worn old owl pair of shoes that, that they're not pretty to look at, but you put your feet and you say, ah, oh, these are them. These are them. And you just love those shoes. The call, I don't think it's a big mysterious thing, it's, it's a, but it's a real thing that you come to know, and when you know it, you know that you know it. And that's what the call is about. But what I really like about these scriptures today is about these individuals who experienced the call. In the first reading, we hear the prophet Isaiah. He's had some kind of a mystical experience. It's hard to know because how do you describe that you heard God speak to you? If you say that, some people may say, uh-oh, put him in the hospital. It's crazy. I hear God speak to me all the time, but it's not in my ears. It's in my heart. It's in my mind. It's in, it's in my inner self. I know what God wants me to do. God wants me to be compassionate and loving and forgiving and help other people and respect and, and to build his kingdom here. I know that. So every day I hear that voice and I hear that call. But Isaiah said he had to experience God, whatever it was. He described it this way. He was sitting there and he saw God on the throne and all these angels all around. And then he was overcome with a sense, oh my God, I'm a sinner. I got a dirty mouth. My lips are impure. And so having said that and, and knowing that, this angel from God goes over to a burning furnace, takes a coal, and goes over and puts it on his lips and his mouth and burns his lips and purifies them, burns away the badness. That's the description. I don't think it's literal, but that's the way he's describing it. So he was made pure by this burning ember that was in the incense that was being offered to God because holy, 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 this is the Lord of hosts. When he was in his sinful, dirty mouth space, that's when he got the call. Right there. Paul says similar thing, and we heard it in Spanish, but he's describing how he has become a great uh, apostle of the Lord. But then he says, but remember where I came from. I used to put Christians in jail. So he's walking down the street and he sees his family over here with a few kids and says, ha, huh, they're Christian? Hmm, let's see about that. He gets the army to come and put them in jail because they're worshiping Jesus, worshiping the Lord. And he was converted there. The story he tells in the Acts of the Apostles is he was knocked to the ground, he was blinded, and he heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right there in his sin. And so he was instructed to follow, go to this town and meet this person who would instruct him what to do. And, and in his sinfulness of, of putting Christian families, even kids in jail, right there, God called him. And in that sinful place, he fell in love with God, fell in love with the Lord, and preached him everywhere was the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, similarly in this gospel, here's the scene. Jesus comes to the edge of the lake. There's so many people that want to hear him and see him. So he asks the, the fishermen to let him get in the boat and, and move it out a little from the shore so that he could see and everybody could hear him. And he preached. And when he finished, he turns to Peter and says, uh, Peter, take your boat out there to the deep waters and throw your net into the sea and for your catch of fish. Now, the apostles had been fishing all night. They caught nothing, Peter said. So they came back to shore and they start cleaning the nets. Now, these nets would get filled with mud and yuck, and they had to, every single one of those little pieces of rope they would clean, and they had to clean them all off so that they wouldn't dry up and get all mucky. You know, and they finished, they just finished cleaning. They're disappointed. They haven't caught a single fish. And then Jesus, get this, here's the funny part. Jesus, the carpenter, says to Peter, the fisherman, <laughs> carpenter says, go out to the deep waters and throw your nets that you've been cleaning for hours. Throw them back in the water and you're going to catch a bunch of fish. And he says, uh, excuse me, Master, but we've been at it all night. We haven't caught a thing. He says, but because you have asked, we will do it. 
And this is where the moment gets incredible. Throws the nets there. They so many fish get caught. The nets are almost ready to tear. So they say, come here, get another boat out here. So they do. And the two boats are to the point of sinking. There's so many fish. And so because of what happened, an experience, call it miraculous, whatever you want, Jesus said to do it. Jesus, the, the, the carpenter, says to Peter, the skilled fisherman, do it. He does it, and wow, OMG. So Peter has an experience of his sinfulness and of his doubt and his fear. And he says, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And right there, right there, when Peter himself admits he's a sinner, and tells Jesus, just leave me, get away from me, because I'm a sinner. Right there, Jesus calls him. He said, from now on, you'll be catching men. He caught us 2,000 years later. Here we are. So I say to you, let's demystify this, this call like it's a one-time thing and suddenly you're a priest or you're married or whatever. No, it's, it's every day. It's all day long. I, I think that, that our school is a perfect example. I'm not saying anything bad about public schools or any other schools, but I'm saying this about our school and about Catholic schools in general. These children come here to learn all the geography, social studies, math, reading, all of that stuff. Here now we get to read, get, learn Spanish too, excellent. But also they pray every day. They come to Mass once a week together. They, they, they open up their, their lives to religion class every single day. They are taught how to listen to God. Did you notice how, how even here it, it, they're taught about liturgy, to come over and get the right reading? And, and during the responsorial psalm, one of the, the younger ones uh, didn't see his place, and so our eighth grade leader went over there and pointed to the place. It's, it's, a, it's an instructing and guiding. And and don't we need to be guided to listen to God? I think we do. So I'm going to ask you, how many, don't raise your hand, but how many say to God once a day, three times a day, even more, here I am, Lord, I've come to do your will. What do you want from me? It's not my experience of Catholics, even, even a priest, I think, to ask that on a regular basis. We get in our saddle and we do what we're supposed to do. I'm in charge. i got to do this. I'm going to do this or that. I'm not going to do this. But how many say to God, more than even once a day, Lord, here I am. I've come to do your will. What do you want? And I want to propose to you that that's the call and that's the response. What happens when you and I say that? Here I am, Lord. I've come to do your will. What do you want? What do you want me to do? I'll tell you what happens. And it's not scientific. It's not even physical, I don't think, but I guess it is in one sense. We open up our spirit right that moment intentionally. We open up that part of us that's deep within, in our spirit, which is filling our whole body and everything that we are, and we say, Lord, what do you want? What's your will? What are you calling me to? The moment that we say to God, what do you want? We're listening in a different way. I mean, imagine it this way. You know that your mom is real busy. She's preparing for a big meal that night or something. A whole bunch of the family's coming over and some friends. And, uh, and, and you notice it. Oh, she's so busy. Oh, God, she probably has a bunch of things she'd like me to do, whatever. And that's all fine and good that you're thinking that. But here's when it changes, when you go in and say, hey, Mom, you look so busy. Is there anything I can do? What would you like me to do? You've just opened the door. And if she says, just go outside and play, or she says, look it, would you clean these dishes and take this trash out, and she gives you some tasks. So what happens if we say that to God? Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. What do you want? Who knows what we'll hear? That's the call. So I'm going to propose this to you. This is your homework, since we've got school here. I'd like to ask you to do it for a week, minimal. Three times a day, morning, noon, and night. Just say to God, here I am. What do you want? What do you want from me? But I even challenge you further to do it for a month. But I'm going to give you the, the silver platter. Do it during Lent. Every single day during Lent, 40 days and 40 nights. 
three times a day, at least, maybe more. Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. What do you want? And I'm going to pretty much guarantee you this. If you do it faithfully and you do it intentionally and you just present yourself to the Lord and ask what the Lord wants, I guarantee you, you're going to hear some different things. Who knows? Maybe one of you will say, maybe I want to be a priest. Maybe I want to be a nun. Maybe I want to take Ms. Montiel's place as principal of our school. <laughs> Just example. Example. I'm going to replace Jerry. He's taught me how to sing, and that's it. I'm taking over. Yeah, that's it. Look at me. Who's going to take my place? Who? But I guarantee you that if we ask the question, we'll begin to hear some answers. Isaiah said he did. Paul said he did. Peter said he did. And he, they didn't do it when they were doing their best and they were in the saddle doing all their own thing. They, they did it when they felt sinful and broken and lacking. And that's when Jesus, that's when God swept in and held them and called them and sent them. 